It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the first talk of our CSC TRR 289 webinar series, which will be given by Professor Christian Büchel. And before we start, I would like to draw your attention to the third ZIPS conference, um, for which the registration is now open. So please, everybody, register if you would like to participate. Um, today, we have two representatives of the young scientists of the CSC, namely Dr. Julian Kleine Borgmann and Dr. Valen Kinchesch who will guide you through the session. And with that, I hand over to Julia. Thank you, Katharina. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Christian Büchel as today's speaker. Uh, he is head of the Institute for Systems Neuroscience at the University Medical Center in Hamburg-Eppendorf, and also professor of the Department of Psychology at the University of Hamburg. After uh, his MD at the University of Heidelberg and his junior residency, actually parts of it here at the Department of Neurology in Essen, he scientifically chose no less than Carl Christen as his mentor and spent four years at uh, the Wellcome Department of Cognitive Neurology at the University College in London. Today, Christian Büchel is a renowned neuroimaging and prediction modeling expert and has received numerous awards for his scientific work, for example, the Advanced Investigator Grant of the European Research Council. Professor Büchel is actively involved as principal investigators uh, in five transregional and collaborative research centers. And in our CSC 289 treatment expectation, he and his group are investigating the role of neural activity patterns in expectancy modulated pain perception, also in the context of placebo analgesia. And that leads me directly to his today's webinar, which is entitled Placebo Analgesia in Bayesian and Predictive Coding Frameworks. What does it all mean? I'm now very much looking forward to Professor Büchel's talk and therefore hand over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure, obviously, to, to come to Essen today. Yeah, perfect. Um, first webinar, um, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, all the team to actually get this SFB going. Uh, it's been a while uh, since we all met uh, in Essen to get it going, but now it's it's reality. And I think this is uh, fantastic. That uh, little pandemic uh, sort of sort of got in our way in terms of celebrations, but obviously we will um, have an occasion later on to, to do that. So usually it says Essen here itself. So in Zoom times, it's somewhere in digital world. And here's the title, uh, Ulrike is actually Ulrike's uh, wish title, Placebo Energies in Bayesian and Predictive Coding Frameworks. Now, I've taken the liberty to sort of extend this a little bit um, because I think, A, this is uh, sort of the first webinar. So I want to set the scene a little bit, tell you uh, about stuff that we've done that is pertinent to this SFB that we've done in the past, some new stuff. Um, I could not uh, sort of avoid talking about nocebo as well, and not also uh, not only nocebo analgesia, but also present a, a recently published study in the respiratory domain. I think that's important. However, um, I've promised Ulrike to also say something about Bayesian integration. And there's a sort of, in the middle, a sort of um, uh, excursion in which I'll uh, use a study to exemplify what this Bayesian uh, modeling all means and why we think it's particularly useful uh, in the context of placebo, but also uh, nocebo effects, be it analgesia or any other effects. So the first is sort of in the past, where I will briefly introduce a little history of placebo analgesia from different labs. Uh, Ulrike plays an important role in this work, but other people like Falk Eipat, Stefan Goiter, who've been in the lab over the years. I will then, as I've said, sort of into, uh, uh, introduce the idea of integration and the possible mechanisms of how we think that this uh, comes together. And then the final part will be about nocebo effects. So here's the sort of rationale of perception. So this is a very broad and very simple model of perception. So the original idea many years ago now, people thought about there is a stimulus out in this physical world and that maps to something that we perceive. And people thought initially that this is a very simple 
one-to-one -one matching. So what's out there, we perceive. However, you all know that this is obviously not true because there are effects like expectation that to a certain extent can shape the path from stimulus to person. But there's even more because there is memory and memory basically is experience. And we all know that experience can also change our expectations. And if you think about placebo effects, conditioning comes to mind. Many experiments use uh, conditioning to actually generate an experience, which then in turn will generate an expectation. And then expectation and the stimulus get some in some miraculous way integrated and then form the percept. That's the contemporary view of how perception works. It's a stimulus and contextual effects. Expectation is just one. There obviously could be different others. All the sort of environmental uh, effects are important. Attention is something else that I'm not looking at here. However, this is the simple model of perception that I think is uh, best to adopt for effects like placebo or um, nocebo effects, mainly in analgesia. So here's a sort of very categorical uh, slide that, will, that I will come back to later when I explain the Bayesian idea. So we think about the idea of a certain uh, placebo analgesic effect the following. So think about you perceive um, you have a certain expectation of a painful stimulus that you expect to elicit a sort of low level of a visual analog scale rating in your private rating world of about 30. And then you get a stimulus that is an intensity that has a sort of VAS rating in your case of 50. And then the idea is that placebo analgesia or integration basically shifts your percept to the left, for instance, here right into the middle. So that difference here now is considered as the placebo effect. So you have an expectation, you have sort of a stimulus that comes in and that expectation in some miraculous way draws your percept in this direction towards your expectation. And let's say it ends up right here in the middle and that distance would be the placebo effect. So that's a sort of very simple model and obviously uh, oversimplified, but I come back to this later. So here is the sort of uh, a little trip down memory lane in terms of the early beginnings of placebo analgesia. I'm skipping the sort of seminal papers by um, Predrag Petrovic and others in Torwega basically come still uh, straight to uh, the first paper Ulrike did when she was in Hamburg. It was the idea of looking at uh, using a cream to elicit placebo analgesia. I'm not going into details, just sort of remind you what we found. It was one of the first studies that we ever did on this topic. And here you can see that behaviorally, as you wouldn't expect, we told people that this cream actually applied not to the leg, but to the hand is something that we use to ease the pain of inserting IV lines in kids. And sort of we told people that this is a potent analgesic. And as you can see here, the pain rating on a control patch with another cream that they thought has no effect was perceived as more painful as compared to the cream on the hand treated with this miraculous cream. This was not only a subjective finding in terms of uh, pain ratings, but you can also see here that in the anterior insula and in the secondary somatosensory cortex here, we found a similar response, namely reduced activation in the placebo condition as compared to the control condition. So. Uh, importantly, addressing also the idea of a reporting bias and others, for instance, Falk Ipad in subsequent studies also used um, skin conductance responses to show that also the skin conductance responses show a, a small decrease due to placebo analgesia. The contrast the other way around. So the question is, well, where do we find more activation in the brain during the placebo condition as compared to the control condition? revealed an activation in the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. That was not too surprising because Predrag Petrovic in his PET study 2001 observed a very similar activation pattern. And then a more specifically very elegant study using 11C carfentanil PET by the Zubieta group actually showed a similar effect in the placebo energesia study, same location, but with the additional information obviously 
that opioid receptors are very dense here. So because this is opioid receptor binding, 11C carfentanil is an opioid ligand. And therefore, you can immediately say that this area seems to have something to do also with um, opioidergic neurotransmission. Again, there was no big surprise. Predrag in 2001 showed there's a big overlap of uh, placebo and opioid analgesia regions. And um, as you probably know, from 1978, the seminal paper by uh, Howard Fields showed that you can actually block placebo analgesic effects by an opioid antagonist, which suggests that endogenous opioids play an important role in uh, the mediation of placebo hypoanalgesia. But as you all know, the brain is not only uh, sort of uh, organized by single voxels and regions that are not connected to each other. Everything is connected uh, densely. And therefore, uh, Ulrike at the time also looked at functional connectivity. And we could show here that there's an um, increased connectivity between the RACC and the periaqueductal gray here, part of that descending pain modulatory system. Um, that was stronger during the placebo analgesia condition as compared to the control condition. And again, this was uh, a replication of something that uh, uh, Predrag Petrovich and others also observed. Now, as I've said, it was clear that the rostral anterior cingulate cortex uh, has opioidergic uh, innervation. Um, endogenous, op uh, endogenous opioids play an important role because you can block placebo analgesia by naloxone. But of course, it would be important to bring the two together. So we decided at the time with Falk Ipad when he was a PhD student in the lab to actually investigate fMRI together with a pharmacological challenge. That means we did an fMRI study together with a naloxone challenge uh, in a double blind fashion. So he, what you see here is the behavioral data. Again, the same paradigm. We used cream on one hand that was supposedly a potent analgesic and compared this to a control cream. And as you would expect in classical placebo analgesia studies, you see on the visual analog scale pain rating that a painful stimulus on the hand with a control cream feels more painful as compared to a painful stimulus on the hand that's been treated with that effective cream. Now, this is the control group that got saline. And what about the naloxone group? As you can see here, and in agreement with the early studies by Howard Fields is the effect is smaller. There's a significant interaction. So this difference is significantly smaller as compared to this difference. Showing that placebo analgesia can be significantly reduced by naloxone. However, as you can see here, it's not totally abolished. And that's obviously um, due to probably other neurotransmitter systems like for instance, the cannabinoid system uh, playing a role here, or maybe also serotonergic systems. So what about the brain? We could show that in the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, that difference that Ulrike already observed, high activation for placebo, low activation for control, this difference got much smaller, again, significant interaction when, uh, when people received um, a, a huge dose of naloxone. And similar responses were observed in the hypothalamus, the periaqueductal gray, and also in the rostroventomedial medulla. Again, we looked at connectivity in the study. Remember, Ulrike showed nice uh, increased coupling between the RACC, rostroventomedial cingulate, and the PAG during placebo analgesia. Falk could actually replicate this. High connectivity, so on the y-axis here is um, connectivity estimates, correlations between both time series and two regions. You see this is higher during placebo as compared to the control group. So uh, similar to what Ulrike showed in her first study. But what happens if you treat people with an, a naloxone? This difference goes away. You see there's no increased connectivity during the placebo condition. Basically both are similar, sort of highlighting the fact that blocking opioidergic neurotransmission um, across the entire brain, obviously, because it was a, syst a systemic uh, um, application, sort of also interferes with at the network level, decreasing the connectivity between those two regions. Now, in our quest for the modulation or the site of modulation, we were in the fortunate position to be able to extend our uh, inquiries 
not only to the brain or brainstem, but uh, due to Jürgen Finsterbusch, our ingenious MR physicist, were also in a position to go down and look at the spinal cord. So we uh, basically implemented spinal cord fMRI and were in a position, or Falk Eipert in this case, was in a position to look of whether we find activation changes in the dorsal horn. That means at the level of the first synapse in the central nervous system. So when efferents from the periphery enter the CNS, whether at this level there's already a modulation in terms of placebo analgesia. And uh, this was indeed the case, as you can see here. First of all, this is the behavior data again. So during placebo, it's less painful as compared to the control condition. Again, using the very simple um, paradigm with creams uh, on, the, on different hands. You can then see that in this area here in the spinal cord dorsal horn, you see a significantly reduced activation during the placebo condition. So this is placebo and this is control and you can see a dramatic effect of a decrease of both activity due to expectation because that's what placebo is similarly simply or already at the first central nervous system synapse all the way down the spinal cord level now we then followed for several leads and uh, many people uh, also look at different determinants of placebo energy that there could be personal good personality However, in this study, we were interested in the role of value. There was a, a funny paper in uh, JAMA showing that a placebo that's more expensive actually is more effective than a placebo that's cheap. And that was actually uh, the prompt that we used to actually perform this study. We wanted to see what the mechanism of this effect is and, and basically can be replicated. Now, Stefan Goiter, when he was a PhD student in the lab, performed this study. And what he did is he actually um, had two placebos and uh, by very uh, complicated measures, we made one placebo more expensive and one cheaper. And both placebos basically were had different values in terms of their treatment. And we actually corroborated whether the value change did work by asking people to uh, actually engage in an auction. So sim similar to what you would do on eBay, people would have to actually pay money for the treatment. And therefore we could ensure that one treatment was more valuable than another treatment. Now to cut a long story short, what we observe here is that indeed in behavior that I haven't shown you here, but also uh, in the brain, a weak or cheap placebo is less effective as compared to a strong placebo, very significant behavioral effect. And most importantly, this effect was also mirrored by activation difference in the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. And you can see here, this is the difference between placebo and control for the cheap placebo. And this here is strong placebo or expensive placebo, the same comparison. Interestingly, we also looked at a valuation uh, task in that same volunteers. So we basically asked them for their willingness to pay for our placebos and other items. And these are the valuation areas, so to speak, that come up. So more value means more bold activity. And as you can see here, if I overlay this in blue here and this in red, you can see basically that these areas are adjacent, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. So there's an intimate connection and that would basically allow the combination of valuation and placebo. But concerning our new ideas, what this area actually does, I'll come back when I talk about um, nocebo hyperalgesia. So we also wanted to look at expectation because as I've said, expectation is the key ingredient to placebo. You expect and the expectation is basically what changes the percept. So in this series of studies, I will show you three studies now with uh, very similar paradigms. We actually wanted to look at the effect of a expectation, not learned, but simply cued, and the effect of pain and neuronal responses. So the first study was also performed by Stefan Goiter, and we had a total of two different stimuli, one that was painful and one that was warm. In addition, we had three visual cues, and these visual cues were followed by warm or painful stimulus with a certain probability. 
So as an example, if I take this stimulus for one participant, it was all randomized across people. So this stimulus was uh, predictive of a painful stimulus in 25% of the trials and a warm stimulus in 75% of the trials. So it was basically a cue for a low intensity because it's more likely to get a warm stimulus. Here's the extreme other case. High Q was basically followed in 75% by a painful stimulus and only 25% by warm. And we also had a medium Q that was basically 50-50. So the first obvious first question was basically, does that change actually perception? In this case, we did not ask people to rate for various reasons. We wanted to have very fast fMRI paradigm. So we actually reverted to um, more objective measures, pupil diameter and uh, skin conductance responses. But I will show you later on other studies that use a very similar paradigm and show you behavioral rating data. So what do we find? First of all, our manipulation worked. What we defined as warm was perceived as below pain threshold, which was defined at 50, and what was hot and painful above. Reaction times to say it was warm or painful were equal for both stimuli. But most importantly, we could show that there was an interesting interaction between intensity and um, expectation. So if I go back to show you a few of the hypotheses, this is what you would expect. So if you would expect that expectation does not play a role whatsoever, a painful stimulus would be rated high and a warm stimulus would be pain, uh, rated low irrespective of the three different cues. If you, for instance, get a simple effect of um, expectation, but no effect of stimulus intensity, those curves will look like this. So they overlap, but they will be higher if you get a high, if you have a high expectation that would be seeing this cue, and it would be low here. And then you have various combinations. So for instance, here is a combination of an expectation or prediction effect plus a stimulus intensity effect. And what was also important is, if you cue people with a certain prediction, these predictions can be true in the end, or they can be wrong. And if they're wrong, what you get is a so-called prediction error. And this is basically what the errors would look like in those stimuli, but I'll come back to this. So the first thing to note is that the objective measures in this study, that's pupil diameter or pupil changes and skin conductance responses, immediately show an interaction. That means that although stimulus intensity is very prominent here at the low uh, Q, it's not so much here at the higher Q. So if you are cued, if you expect a high painful stimulus and you get a high painful stimulus, your, activate, your basically skin conductance response is pretty low. However, if you expect something high and your uh, painful level, uh, you expect something um, to be high, so low, a low stimulus, but expectation high, there's an increase. So it's even reverted here. So expectation can actually change or flip stimulus intensities. Same here for pupil diameter. What do we find in the brain? Very interesting. If we look at posterior parts of the insula, which includes the parietal operculum, secondary somatosensory cortex, the dorsal posterior insula, we find a very prominent stimulus effect. So you can see here, irrespective of the three different cues, the two lines are on top of each other. So high painful stimuli give more bold signal as compared to low painful stimuli. Now, if you move anterior in the insula to the anterior part of the insula, that pattern dramatically changes and looks very similar to skin conductance responses um, and pupil responses. So you see a big difference in terms of intensity if the Q is low, so you expect a low painful stimulus. However, if you expect a high painful stimulus, if you really get a high painful stimulus, it's actually quite low. If you get a low painful stimulus and you expect high, it's actually much higher. So this is basically a um, indication of an expectation, but also importantly of a prediction error uh, response. That means it's coding the difference between what you expect and what you actually get. This is a replication of this study. In this case, we used three um, different levels of intensity and three different cues and some other conditions. 
But the result that we observed is exactly the same. Posterior part of the insula is stimulus encoding and anterior part is a mixture of expectation and expectation and um, prediction error, very similar to here. Now, this study or these two studies actually um, had the problem that a prediction and a prediction error occur at the same time. And that's simply because the bold signal is extremely slow. So the effects that I show you here in predictions and prediction errors are basically all at the same time. And that's always something that is uh, not expected. So we would expect a temporal orchestration of these effects. But as you all know, fMRI is not the technique to allow you to look at that. So what we did is we adopted exactly this paradigm here that we've uh, performed in fMRI and transformed it into an EEG experiment. It was done uh, by Andreas Strube, PhD in my lab, and it's just been um, uh, published uh, last week in eLife. So here's, here's the, um, the paradigm. So as I said, we had three different stimuli in terms of intensity, 42, 46, and 48 degrees Celsius. And we had three different levels of Q, low, medium, and high. To make the whole study a little bit more complicated, we also had pictures, aversive pictures of different levels and also different cues. So instead of a three by three design, we actually had a six by six design. However, for brevity, I will only talk about the pain conditions. And as I promised earlier, I want to show you also behavioral effects. So how do pain ratings change as a function of intensity, prediction or prediction error? So the first thing to observe in the behavior ratings is very simple. High painful stimuli, 48 degrees, are rated higher than medium, are rated higher than low. Very simple. However, as you can see here within all these bars, especially in the medium and the high intensity, you can also see that expectation has an effect and it's highly significant effect. So expectation actually increases, the higher the, the, higher the expectation, the higher the perceived intensity, as you can see here. However, as you see here, prediction error in terms of behavioral ratings, uh, only a trend effect, not significant. This was the same actually in this study and the same in this study, almost identical behavior results, both at a trend level. So the first thing that we looked at in this EEG experiment is a very simple main effect of pain, just to get you acquainted to um, EEG. What you can see here is the following. So that's a time frequency representation of the EEG responses. So we have time on the x-axis and we have different frequencies on the y-axis. Stimulus onset happens here. So that means the thermode ramps up to the different temperatures. And what you see here is a statistical analysis of a parametric response. That means it's more activity for higher temperatures. And you see two things, a positive correlation of gamma band activity with stimulus intensity and a negative correlation with alpha beta activity in this case, and probably also lower frequency positive correlation. And that pretty much agrees with uh, many studies that Markus Plona and others uh, did. So that's just a sanity check that we are able to look at pain. More interestingly is now we want to look at the effects of expectation and prediction errors also in a parametric fashion. So we can have, we have a low expectation effect, medium and high. And the first, what we see here is, now this is not stimulus onset anymore. This is now Q onset. And you can see that there is a increase in alpha beta frequencies. So more alpha beta power with more or with increased um, expectation. And that can be seen here. That these bar plots are taken from this significant cluster. And you can see here that for each of the three intensities, you see a nice increase with um, 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 expectation uh, strength. So low, medium, high expectation. And this goes all the way to the um, basically time point where the stimulus happens. And this is what I'm going to show you next is namely what happens in terms of prediction errors. And here we observed a negative effect again more, in this case, more prediction error gives less gamma power. And now here, don't forget, this onset here is now stimulus onset and not um, Q onset anymore. 
And what we observe here is a pattern that codes the absolute prediction error. So the absolute deviation of what you expect to what you actually get. And importantly, if you put this all together, so this is the expectation effect. And now sort of with the same, on the same timeline, these are the prediction errors effect. You can see here the expectation effect happens early. And then after stimulus onset, the um, prediction errors uh, happen. The reason why we had to analyze it separately is, is seen here in this bigger band. The um, time between Q and stimulus was jittered. So we could not use a time scale because uh, that would basically uh, wrong for the stimulus. So there was a, a jitter that was different for different trials and different people uh, in terms of when the stimulus actually happened. But importantly, early effects of stimulus late effect uh, of prediction, late effect of um, um, uh, prediction errors. And uh, basically one of the reviewers criticized that our lowest intensity was only 42 degrees and that might not be painful. If we replicate or repeat the analysis dropping the lowest intensity, we'll see exactly the same pattern here, the same negative um, activation in the gamma band for increased prediction errors. Now, we've talked about expectations, about the stimuli. We have already talked about placebo energies here. But what I want to talk about now is a little bit about the deintegration process, the idea of why, how this comes together. And now I'm coming back to this old scheme and basically want to try to develop it a little bit further to sort of uh, introduce that Bayesian idea. Now, this is what I said before. So you get a certain, um, you have a certain expectation at low VAS intensity 30, you get a stimulus of 50, you get basically then a percept that for instance is at 40 and this difference is what we call the placebo effect. However, now think about the first alternative if your expectation and your sensory information are equally precise. There's obviously noise in all these things and the precision might differ. So in the first case, let's assume that it's not a bar, a point estimate, but it's actually a real distribution. Now in this sort of toy case, the distribution of the painful, the, the painful stimulus, the nociceptive input is as precise as your expectation. So okay, you would say, okay, so if this is precise and this is precise, let's still meet in the middle. But how about if we make this, the expectation less precise? So you basically have a nociception that's pretty precise, but indicated by this flatter Gaussian here is means that your treatment expectation is not very precise. It's pretty broad. Now, would you agree that we again meet in the middle? You probably won't. You would say, no, the placebo effect's probably weaker. And that's exactly what a Bayesian integration would tell you. If you would formally take the precision of your expectation in Bayesian sense, a prior into account to integrate with your incoming nociception, in Bayesian terms called a likelihood to get a posterior, what I would argue is similar to what we basically perceive. And it's not here, as you can see, but here. So the Bayesian framework allows a very simple mathematical treatment of A, the integration process, and B, at the same time, takes into account the precision of your estimates. And that makes it very simple. And it's, there's actually no miracle when, when we have uh, basically Ben Seymour wrote an article about uh, perception and pain and the role. And uh, in a little chapter said, yeah, well, that's all very old and uh, not, not to mention, of course, it's Bayesian. So uh, just to set the scene. So here's, here's the idea again. Same precision, we meet in the middle, higher precision of nociception, we go here. Now, the idea is, now can we test this experimentally? So we thought about this for a long time and then with Avina Graal, a PhD student in the lab, we designed a very complicated experiment that took a long time to execute actually. Because what she did is we wanted to actually have the expectation more or less precise. And we thought about many things how to do that. And the best we came up with is that during a conditioning period when we let people learn what they can expect, we could either have a constant reduction or a variable reduction. So let me talk you through it. In a standard conditioning paradigm, you basically introduce your placebo cue 
and you lower your temperature, let's say to 30. So in the control condition, you get 70. And in your placebo condition, you lower to 30. So the volunteer thinks, oh, wow, this treatment seems to work because it's less painful. Now, what we now do is here in the orange condition, we do exactly that. So every trial was basically reduced to a VAS level of 30 and always the same temperature. In that variable condition, or that's another group of people actually, we actually did the same mean of reduction, but actually each trial varied around that mean. So some were not as potent in terms of reduction, some were really good, then it was pretty bad, really good, and so on and so forth. So during the learning, we introduced the variance or decreased precision and see whether this actually works. And it did. We could show that in the group that has less variance in their expectation, so conditioned with a constant temperature, the placebo analgesic effect in the text, test phase was significantly stronger as compared to the other um, group. Now, how about a formal Bayesian integration? Can we do this? And that's what we do. So what we did is we actually fitted Gaussian curves to the estimates of their treatment expectation. I am showing you two volunteers here, exemplary, to show what this looks like. So this is actually during the conditioning phase, their treatment expectation ratings during the conditioning phase. These are actually ratings during the um, test phase in terms of perceived sensory input and the fitted Gaussian to that. Same for another volunteer and here. And as you can see here, if you look at the two Gaussians is that this volunteer has a pretty precise expectation and a pretty noisy or less precise uh, nociception. Whereas this is exactly the opposite, quite precise nociception, less precise expectation. Now, if we take Bayesian integration to predict what the percept should be, in this case, this is more precise. So it should draw basically uh, the percept towards it. So percept closer to expectation, whereas here the percept is closer to nociception. And now I show you what we really observed in terms of the data. These red dots are the ratings and it nicely fits to uh, the perceived, um, to the the, the percept sort of showing that the posterior of our Bayesian integration was very, very similar to actually the perception in uh, these volunteers. And if we do this for the whole group, comparing our Bayesian integration model, which is the blue one here, and these are on the y-axis, all uh, on the x-axis, all individual volunteers, you see that in most of the uh, cases, the Bayesian model explains the data better than the control model. And that gets you a sort of model uh, evidence here or model uh, probability, posterior probability, and our um, Bayesian model outperformed the control model. Now, there are some intuitive predictions uh, from this model as well, because if you go back here, is that the, the, the stronger the um, basically the stronger the uh, prior or the expectation pulls the nociception or the percept, the stronger the placebo effect should be. And this is what we call an attraction weight in this model that may be basically means how, how hard it can push um, the percept away from um, the nociception. And as you can see here, this is positively correlated with the placebo effect. And that's obviously not surprising because that's the essence, this distance is the essence of the placebo effect. This was also done in fMRI, and uh, we now had the opportunity looking at model-based fMRI to actually look at whether we can have an, a sort of estimate of the precision of the prior in the brain, and we found this to be the case in the periaqueductal gray. We found this attraction wave that basically pulls away uh, your percept from um, the nociception, so higher attraction wave, higher placebo, actually to be inversely related to activation in the periaqueductal grain. So here's this little insertion of in terms of um, Bayesian modeling, base models. So the headline is Bayesian is not Bayesian. And the, the biggest source of confusion that I always encounter on many talks is that the that, that, that two different ways we can, we can do Bayesian in, in neuroscience. And one is a true Bayesian model, and one, and 
The second one you see more often and it's getting more and more uh, um, frequent and that's a good thing is that you can do Bayesian parameter estimation. So that means you have standard models, including standard uh, ANOVAs, and you just simply estimate your parameters in the Bayesian sense. But let's come to the real Bayesian models. This is a model in which the subject is assumed to form Bayesian integration, just as I showed you in the previous slides, but there are other, or there are many examples in the literature. Tim Behrens has done some elegant work in Bayesian learners or Nathaniel Dore for exploit, for explore exploit dilemmas. And in these models, often estimated uncertainty, probability, or expectation can be seen as priors. And you can see here, that's what we did in our case, expectation was used as a prior. And then sometimes they're really complicated and these priors change um, as a function of time. This is in contrast to Bayesian parameter estimation. You can basically use any model and just simply uh, estimate your uh, parameters in a Bayesian sense. For instance, simple reinforcement learning models. The only difference to frequentist approaches is you have to define a prior, what you expect, for instance, for each parameter, like a learning rate. And then where come these priors from? Previous experiments, or you can also do a hierarchical uh, modeling where the group informs the prior of each individual. And then just a little uh, note about the estimation, then you basically come across three different uh, sort of um, flavors of how to estimate that. There's one, uh, if you're very lucky, you can analytically uh, solve these problems. And that's if the prior and the posterior are so-called conjugate. And for that, you have analytic solutions. And what I've just shown you is a, a Bayesian, um, a normal distribution as a prior and a normal distribution as a posterior. And their integration is that simple and can be solved analytically. That's usually not the case. And then you have to revert to two other techniques. And one is sampling, um, sometimes also called uh, Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain modeling and some software packages that people use as Bax or Stan or others. Or um, there is variational base, a more elegant approach, um, faster approach than sampling, uh, but with, with a little bit more assumptions. So that's sort of in a nutshell, the difference between Bayesian models and Bayesian parameter estimation. As I've said, this is extremely frequent now and will get more and more frequent. This is a little rarer, but it's very powerful because most of these studies have shown that people actually behave Bayesian to a certain degree. Now quickly, the last part of the talk, I want to talk about nocebo. This is my favorite set of slides for nocebo effects. This is a, a high school graduation prank in Hamburg, where uh, it was believed that um, uh, the, uh, the, the high school graduation um, uh, kids actually spiked drinks using vodka for the fifth and second graders, the young kids. And uh, parents were upset, uh, the, uh, the ambulances were called. And yes, you can see here, very dramatic. The kid basically, I think also had yeah, uh, uh, oxygen here, they have an IV line going, actually the two kids, as you can see here. Uh, and it then turned out in the Department of Forensic Medicine uh, that the alcohol level in their blood was zero. So there was nothing spiked, yet they felt dizzy and they were drunk. Beautiful uh, example of a nocebo effect. Now this can also be studied in the lab, of course, and this is work by Alexandra Tinnermann. And I keep this short, she actually used two different creams that are supposedly uh, against a neurodermatitis, have, an, may, uh, have side effects of pain, uh, hypersensitivity. That was our cover story. And actually they come in two sort of forms. This is the cheap one and this is the expensive one. And uh, Alexandra showed that the cheap one actually has a, a weaker plan, nocebo effect as compared to the expensive one. This was uh, also shown in the periaqueductal grain. You see stronger uh, activation for uh, the expensive nocebo as compared to the cheap nocebo. Also similar in the spinal cord, which was a replication of what Stefan Goiter already found in the spinal cord. So increased activation for nocebo as compared to uh, control condition. <clears throat> 
I'm sort of rushing a little bit because I'm uh, looking at my watch is already a quarter to six and I don't want to keep you too long. But this important here is namely that we found a negative correlation of the effect of the strength of nocebo in those people in the rostria anterior cortex. So more nocebo, less activation as the take home message. And that's interesting because if you interpolate this to the left, you basically go into the placebo domain. And remember when I showed you Stefan Goethe's data, a cheap placebo was somewhere here and a strong placebo was somewhere here. So you could interpret the whole anterior cingulate, rostral anterior cingulate cortex as a simple one dimensional vector showing or simply coding what we then would call probably something like a value of treatment. No SIBO value of treatment is extremely low. The placebo is extremely high and basically at least it's compatible with this idea. And now the final slides that I show you is a, a also recently uh, um, published study where we followed this up, no SIBO effects in a totally different domain. So welcome to respiratory medicine. And we did that before actually people talked about COVID. And it was actually uh, motivated by a study by Ted Kapchuk's lab uh, by Wexler. You probably many of you know this study. Uh, it's very simple. If you give somebody who is suffering from asthma, a inhaler that has a beta, beta 2 mimetic, so that's actually a drug that works against asthma, you basically enlarge uh, your, the airway uh, resistance. So airway resistance goes down and you breathe easier. This is a drug, for instance, albuterol. So what they do is they basically gave people albuterol or placebo. Uh, we forget about the sham acupuncture for a minute. And what you can see here is that the subjective improvement between treatment and no treatment was very similar for acupuncture, placebo, and the real drug. So that's what people felt. However, if you measure airflow differences, albuterol changed airflow resistance dramatically. So that's basically the idea why it works. A placebo didn't. Yet, they felt almost as good as having the same drug. So it's a nice dissociation between subjective perception and what actually sub uh, objectively happens with your system. And I'll come back to this when I show you our data. So here's our extremely complicated fMRI study. People were lying in the scanner wearing a PEEP mask. That's something that you get before you get intubated uh, when you're suffering from pneumonia. So many people know this by now. Um, so airtight, and we basically could measure the total airflow in and out, but they were spontaneously breathing. We also were able to in introduce odors into that stream. So they basically got different odors, um, different flavors like rose, different types of rose. It was actually of alcohols. In addition, what we could do is in the inspiratory part of the system, we could introduce so-called loads. So that's basically little sieves that we could introduce and you can basically then you breathe harder because you breathe against the resistance. This is now very easy to, um, to explain to people. It's as wearing a sort of tight FFP2 mask is a high resistance. If you wear a simple surgical mask, that's a low resistance and no resistance is if you just breathe like nothing. So what we did in this complicated experiment, we had a experience phase that we also could call a conditioning phase. So in this case, they were exposed to two different odors. One was alcohol, one hexanol, and the other methyl hexanoate. One was actually conditioned to be followed by a load. That means you're breathing like through an FFP2 mask. And the other one, there was nothing so easy. Now we told them this actually that drug here, that odor, that gas is responsible for this effect. So it constricts your airways. And they learned this. And then we had a classical, we call it expectation phase that the reviewer made us to call it, usually we call it test phase. This is the conditioning phase and that's the test phase. But for various reasons, we were not allowed to call it this way. And here we have as in our standard nocebo, placebo, the same resistance that's sort of in the middle between no load and this um, tighter load. And what we do is, this is actually the fMRI paradigm already. So we have a four second visual cue. We then play them the order for 20 seconds. And then for 50 seconds, they get this load and then they in the end rate. So what's the result? It's very similar to the Wexler study. 
If we look at the, the ratings of dyspnea, now what we do is we only look at this phase here where the loads were absolutely identical, so no difference. And yet people smelling one of the gases actually said, oh, the dyspnea is much higher, right? This is, this is the conditioning phase and this is the test phase. So that's real. So there was real difference in terms of the load and here, this is uh, actually the test phase. So I was a little unclear. So the purple thing is the top thing here and the green one is this here. So identical loads is what you see here in green. Now, if we measure end expertise CO2, airway resistance was the most important one. You see there's no differences, no difference. Ventilation in terms of volume, no difference. So similar to the Wexler study, subjectively a big effect. However, in terms of objective measurements, no difference. Now let's look at fMRI responses. So the first thing is we look at the real experience phase. So remember, one was a high load, the other was no load. And what we observe here in agreement with previous studies was um, a high activation in this phase of the insular cortex. So this is now bold activity because it's such a long um, uh, design. I show you the bold time courses here. So that's begin, so that's the cue, that's the order, that's when they breathe against resistance and that's the rating. And you can nicely see here in yellow, it's highly elevated in the experienced dyspnea condition. And that's when you breathe against this resistance. And this is in the insulin. Here are the parameter estimates you see here. When you really experience dyspnea, this goes up. But as you can see here, the anterior insula is not concerned about sort of the test phase. So when there is no objective difference, the insula basically shows no difference. And this is in contrast to periaqueductal gray, which shows a similar increase during the uh, or weaker increase during experience. So the conditioning phase, and then a significant difference during the expectation phase. And remember, the loads were extreme, were identical in this phase. But the most prominent and the biggest effect that we observed here was during the expectation phase per se. And this was actually a very strong activation, or you can call it deactivation for the expectation dyspnea phase. So this is actually the control and that's the so-called that the nocebo condition. And you see there's a decrease here. And that's exactly the same as uh, Alex Tinnerman observed in her pain study is a negative effect in the rostral anterior cingulate cortex during um, nocebo uh, uh, respiration in this case. So basically showing that probably um, our guess of uh, treatment value is not that bad because it transfers not only from the pain system, but also to the respiratory system. So in summary, placebo analgesia is mediated by endogenous opioids. That's old news. We can show modulation already at the spinal level, which also goes for um, nocebo hyperalgesia. RACC, VNPFC are related to placebo and nocebo, signed responses they are, and also a value of treatment. That's not only the case in pain, but as I've just shown you, also the case uh, in respiration. And finally, I've shown you some first attempts to actually show that integration of expectation and nociception in placebo um, analgesia could or is in, in agreement with the Bayesian integration theme. And uh, with that, um, I thank you for your attention and all the um, parts of the team who performed all the studies, but I've also already shown you many pictures of them. Thanks.